Okay, so welcome to Living Writers interview series. Today we have Zach, who you guys might know as uh, Amazon and Washington Post and USA Today bestselling author Penelope Bloom. So welcome, Zach. Thanks, Thanks. so much for talking to us today and, you know, exposing yourself <laughs> to all of us. Yeah. So what made you decide um, to write under the pen name Penelope? Um, well, the the very first thing that happened was I was making the cover for my first book and um, I needed a pen name at the bottom while I was kind of trying to pick out the fonts mm -hmm. and my dog was at my feet and my dog's name is Penelope. And so I, it was supposed to be a placeholder <laughs> name at first. I, my wife and I were working together, so we had decided to do a female pen name and the idea was just that she was kind mm -hmm. of be the face she'd be the face of the, I guess the brand and she would be the one who would communicate with everybody mm -hmm. and do all my emails and social media. And then she would help me. She still helps me with editing the books and kind of reading over them to make sure I don't do anything too stupid. And, um, but that was the beginning of the whole Penelope thing was just that I put my dog's name down as a placeholder because I was making the cover. And then after like three weeks of messing with it over and over, I got used to seeing Penelope on the cover and I, I was kind of like, oh, that's kind of, that's good enough, you know. It's hard to really know what yeah. makes a good uh, pen name anyway, so I figured it was better than your own dog's name. <laughs> so do you guys still, um, well, I guess, so you're doing the writing, it's just mm -hmm. you, and then she's doing some yeah. other, just, is she just the face, or? She's, um. well, so I don't, I've never really put, actually never at all put her face out anywhere, so I didn't want it to be a literal mm -hmm. face, I just... Um, yeah. I kind of, well, so when I, I got to backtrack slightly. So like when I first started, I was a Catholic high school teacher and I yeah. had a lot of concerns about privacy for kind of obvious mm -hmm. reasons there. And mm -hmm. I was writing my first couple books while I was still actively a teacher. And I started over the summer and I went into it thinking that I had no idea if I'd be able to make a career out of it. But if anybody found out what I was doing, I would lose my real career. And so my oh, wife yeah. kind of, we talked about it and then she said that, you know, we should just kind of make it as anonymous as we can. And then um, I kind of asked around for some people's advice about male pen name, female pen name. And the consensus mm -hmm. was kind of that there's this weird, it's almost like an expectation if you're a male writer in romance to be mm -hmm. almost like the characters you write. And that's not, I'm just kind of mm -hmm. like a nerd, you know, I, <laughs> I'm definitely not the, the lumberjack type or anything like that. So the, mm -hmm. um, the option of kind of like putting myself in the, in the spotlight in that way and trying to market myself as this macho manly man just wasn't really a choice. So I ended up deciding mm -hmm. to go as anonymous as I could. And then because my wife was going to be the one managing all my interactions and everything, and I was just going to write the books, we went, mm -hmm. we felt okay doing the female thing. And then, um, about like two or three years into it we've we have little kids and they kind of they got older and she transitioned into being more the stay-at-home mom and kind of the responsibilities there kind of escalated mm -hmm. and so she ended up just she's kind of eased off of helping me with all that stuff which I don't do a great job of it on my own anyway <laughs> so now it's almost like I just sort of engage here and there but um, so now it's it's just kind of one of those things that it started out one way and there was never really a great way to sort of transition out of being Penelope Bloom. So I just kind of yeah. go with it at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's so hard for especially that genre of writing to be authentic with your writing and also like have your real self out there. Yeah, exactly. But you, um, you've written like both perspectives are right. I think I was mm -hmm. thinking like in Ruthless Love that you, it's like back and forth, like a man, a man and woman. Yeah, all of my books, the dual perspective, which oh, okay, I think okay. like 90, 95% of people do that. That was one other, I was, I mm -hmm. think it's kind of interesting because I think a criticism, if someone was kind of watching this and thinking, oh, that's so deceptive, you know, trying to put yourself out there as a woman and represent a woman's thoughts as a man. Mm -hmm. But um, to me, it's kind of, everybody doing this is writing both the male and female perspective and so we're we're both trying yeah. to get in the other head you know the other side's head and some people are probably better at getting in somebody else's head than their own gender's head anyway mm -hmm. and then i think kind of bringing a different perspective to it is an interesting you know it makes for more interesting characters and 
Yeah. I kind of think if you go into it expecting a man to be writing it, it changes the way you read it too. And I always want mm -hmm. people to just read my books as a blank slate versus coming in and thinking, oh, this was written by a man. Let's see what he does, you know? So I kind mm -hmm. of, I, I still, if I had to change how I did it going back, I think I still probably would stick with the way I've done things. Yeah, absolutely. So do you find it easier to write um, for a male character or a female character? That's a good question. Um, I think in some ways it's actually easier for me to write the woman's perspective because mm -hmm. I can kind of do it almost in the sense of I can I can identify the things to me as a man that would make a woman attractive or appealing where it can it's mm -hmm. almost a little more like it's more difficult for me to try to identify what makes the man appealing for my female readers so it's kind of yeah. you know I okay. some of the stuff I think this, this just makes him seem like a jerk or, you know, like I wouldn't like this guy, but I have to kind of accept, you know, what I've read and then kind of the notes I take. And so I'm sometimes it feels a lot harder for me to write the guy. And I think there's some parts of it, you know, when I'm describing the woman from the guy's perspective, I can make that maybe a little more genuine. But mm -hmm. when I'm trying to be the guy and then embody the things that I think will make him appealing to readers, that that part actually feels harder to me as a man. And then mm -hmm. when I read, um, kind of funny, when I read romance, I, I usually find the women are a lot, it almost seems like they struggle more with the female character and then they get the guy more right. So I, I think it's kind of, it goes both ways. It's interesting. Yeah. Which the goal isn't to make the woman, you know, desirable necessarily. So that's also that I'm not the target audience when I'm reading mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I've even heard a lot of, um, female romance authors say that they get a lot of criticism for who, their female character is and they say like and that character is themselves so then yeah, they have yeah. to take all that criticism and they're like yeah. well if you don't like my character then i guess you don't like me either. yeah exactly yeah i can't write myself stay away from that <laughs> yeah if i wrote my, <laughs> if i wrote myself as one of my characters that would uh probably not sell too well oh my gosh so so you were a catholic school teacher so what what gave you guys the idea to start writing books like this um, Did you have any like training and writing, geez. any background? Uh, yeah, so in college, I went, um, I had a double minor in creative writing in English, and then I majored in psychology. But I kind of, in the mm -hmm. back of my mind, I always wanted to write. But I wanted mm -hmm. to write fantasy books. And, you know, a typical guy, <laughs> nerdy guy, I want fantasy sci fi. <laughs> and um, so mm -hmm. while I was teaching, that was kind of in the back of my mind. And I'd been teaching for like two or three years. And I always sort of chipped at this fantasy book in my spare time and would write like a hundred pages and I would reread the first couple sentences and try to imagine it from an editor's perspective and then hate it and delete it and start over the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I never got anywhere mm -hmm. because I, I was so personally invested in making it perfect. And um, mm -hmm. in the meantime, my older brother was actually writing romance and he was doing like erotica, short erotica stories at the time. And he had told me about him and I always kind of joked with, you know, with my wife and with him and kind of saying, mm -hmm. you know, like, he's basically writing porno books. And I thought it was <laughs> funny. And, and I thought that wasn't really yeah. something that would appeal to me. And um, mm -hmm. then we found out, it was like my going into my fourth year of teaching, we were going to have my second daughter. And it just kind of became obvious that I needed to find a way to make money outside teaching. And I was mm -hmm. looking at writing and then I was looking at how can I even figure out self-publishing. And the original goal was that I would kind of figure out self-publishing with what looked to be kind of the, the biggest thing in self-publishing, which was romance. And then I was hoping that I would take mm -hmm. that knowledge and sort of transition it to fantasy. And so I got my wife on board because I was like, I'm not a big romance reader. I've obviously watched a bunch of romance movies with her and read books and stuff but it wasn't really my thing that I devour like I would fantasy or sci-fi and um, so I started out with her and then I kind of I met a uh, beta reader early on too who really helped me just sort of she became my editor and she helps me too just if I'm doing something that's stupid or that just really doesn't fit in the genre she's kind of like what are you doing <laughs> you know like that's not right you got to fix mm -hmm. this and um, so it started out as kind of like a a challenge I guess to to figure out self-publishing but with this genre that I wasn't comfortable with and then as I got going though I I sort of found myself liking it um it was mm -hmm. 
it was more fun for me to write because I didn't feel so terrified of I, I hadn't spent my whole life thinking of the perfect story that I wanted to write in this genre. So I was able mm-hmm. to be a little more free and loose with it. And then I found it really satisfying mm-hmm. to just be able to get books out and kind of come up with an idea, tell a story. And then kind of along the way, there'd be things that I was really happy with and things that I wanted to work on. But I I ended up really liking that process of just the the turnover. You know, you get a book out, you kind of see the results, and then you get your criticism and your feedback, the things you did good, the things you did badly. And then you can really quickly just go on and apply that to the next book. And for me, that's kind of been the addicting part because I, in anything mm-hmm. I get interested in, I become a little bit of a perfectionist. And so I like mm-hmm. the process of just trying to get better at stuff. And so for me, it was kind of like, it wasn't what I planned on, but I ended up deciding that I wanted to be really good at writing romance books. And I'm still trying to get good at it, but I enjoy the the challenge of it, I guess. So it kind of fell into yeah. it by accident, but I've I've come to really like it in the process. So what was the first one that like got traction that you decided like, okay, I can, I'm getting some. It was my first one actually when I, when I started Penelope Bloom. Yeah, it was, it was called his, it was a mafia romance and it um, ranking wise, it hit like 200 something. And I don't Mm -hmm. remember the exact numbers, but I remember money wise, just kind of, we were looking at it and I thought, you know, if I, if I could do this full time, instead of trying to squeeze it in, in every spare moment I have, you know, I mean, I was literally, I had kids taking quizzes and I was kind of like typing up my story on my little iPad on the podium while they were doing quizzes. And um, mm. so I was thinking how much more I could get done if I had more time. And it was looking back, it's kind of terrifying that I made the decision, but at the time it felt like an obvious decision. And I just sort of, I told my principal I was putting in my notice and which was kind of crazy because my wife wasn't working at the time so we had two kids in a a house and you know so I I quit based on that one book and then the next three didn't do as well so that was kind of scary but it was Mm -hmm. three yeah four books my first four books kind of did okay and then it was my fifth book that it ended up going like top 50 and then that that was a lot more um, security for me that I I was kind of able to take a Mm -hmm. breath and be like okay maybe this wasn't a horrible choice and then kind of go from there. So how long was it? Um, like that span between the, the first successful one and the second successful one that I you was, like hung in there. I was doing a book every month. So it was four weeks per book. And then just, that would have been, yeah, it was like, I think October was around the time I released the first book. And then that first successful one was like December or something like that. And so mm-hmm. it, chronologically it wasn't super long it felt really long to me because it was a downward trajectory in terms of how the books were performing so it was kind of like book one did a lot better than I thought it would book two was kind of like acceptable but a little worrying and then book three Mm -hmm. was kind of unsustainably bad and then book four was like I lost money (laughs) and so I was kind of thinking oh great if this pattern continues I'm going to be begging for a teaching job soon and then um, I got fortunate with the fifth one I think I actually remember thinking if this fifth book doesn't do well I'm honestly going to have to figure something else out and so I don't really know Mm -hmm. how things would have gone differently if that one didn't take off like it did so what do you attribute the success of the first and fifth from um it's I think I started off kind of I got a lot of advice so I got really lucky when I started and I had people kind of holding my hand through it because my brother was already involved and he had friends that were kind of saying, yeah, this is the kind of thing you want to do. And this is how you set up your keywords. So a lot of the technical stuff, I was really Mm -hmm. lucky because I had help, but there's, Mm -hmm. there's sort of this aspect of publishing where you want to believe that the only thing that matters is the book, because as you know, obviously Mm -hmm. as a self-published author, you have to kind of get your hands dirty and everything in the marketing side. But I think, very few people actually get into self-publishing who don't care about the book and the writing. So it's, you want to believe that that's the most important thing. And that's kind of a hard thing to accept. Sometimes if a book fails, you want to be like the book failed because I did a bad job writing the book. But sometimes the book I think fails because you didn't package it well, like with the title and the cover and the blurb, or you kind of didn't time all your marketing correctly. And um, so for me, I think the first book, I was kind of fast and loose with my 
cover design and I did something a little out there that at the time everybody who was trying to help me was like what are you doing <laughs> like I did the, the title it was like vertical on the side and it took up like half of the cover and it just said his in big red letters and um, it didn't really look like covers that were out at the time but I thought it looked cool so I was I was a little stubborn and I, I thought you know I, I think this looks cool I'm gonna go with it and that one did well and then the second one I did mine in the same kind of format and it did okay and I've learned now that book twos don't usually do as well as a book one it's kind of like a if book two does well it feeds success into book one so it's kind of deceptive too like if you're if you were comparing like a pie chart you know you have book one and then book two and three and four but what's really happening is book four might be all the way down here but it made book one do this and then it made book two do this and book three so you can kind of take those little slices and stack them on book four but I didn't really see it that way so I think in some ways they weren't failing as badly as I thought they were and then the other part of it was just that I started getting a little um, I went in the wrong direction for a little bit in terms of getting away from trying to stand out and I started moving toward trying to fit in with the design and the cover and the blurbs and so as I was losing confidence I was starting to look more at what other people were doing and trying to think okay well how can I change what I'm doing to be more like that and more like that and then um, mm -hmm. the fifth book was when I kind of broke out of that and I I tried to do something it wasn't dramatically different but it was I did a couple of little things that I think helped me kind of stand out a little more and so Yeah. You never know, though. That's that's one of the other frustrating things is the best thing you can do is kind of make a educated guess about why one book did well and one didn't. But at the end of the day, there's so many other factors, in, including just when you release. Like for all you know, a book you release in February could flop that would have gone crazy in September. You know, there's just no way to really know. So sometimes you just kind Yeah. of have to gently accept your theory and then move on, but not hold it like it's gospel. Absolutely. I guess that's what's good about churning books out is you can, you know, get an idea of like what Yeah. is going to work or not. Mm -hmm. So, so what's been your writing process? I know a lot of people, they, um, they have an idea and then they plot out the, the whole thing or they outline it or they use certain plot methods. How do you go about your books? I've, I've tried both. I think in, in broad terms, you could be a plotter or a pantser, like writing by the seam of your pants. And um, I started out plotting a lot because I read um, probably still, I think a really helpful book was, it was called Story Engineering by Larry Brooks. Mm -hmm. And he kind of, he comes from a screenwriting background. And so he broke it down into basically like four chunks. And there's like a blueprint in there for just the effective times to do certain things within a story that they kind of resonated with me. And he did a, he has like a free blog too, where he kind of broke down like the Martian And he was just showing how if you look at a lot of successful stories, they have these kind of benchmark moments that come at predictable times. And that was kind of what I really wanted um, coming into writing. I thought, you know, there's got to be somebody who's looked at this and said, like, what is the most satisfying way to tell a story? And there's got to be some universal similarities from successful story to successful story. And I think he did a really good job of kind of giving me that. So I started off outlining based on those points and I was very strictly doing it too, like by word count. So it was like at 16,000 words, I need to kind of start having this happen. And, and, you know, you try to roughly hit it. And I probably did like three books like that. And then I, I tried to do maybe the next five or six like that. And I've gradually figured out that I can plot maybe like the first 15% of my book but past that mm -hmm. I start to kind of veer away and then if you deviate from your plot at 15 percent chances are you're going to ruin everything that came after it so it's kind of like it feels really frustrating when you pour three or four days into making this super detailed plot and then two days into writing mm -hmm. you look at it and you're like oh if if he does this it's going to change everything and then you realize though in the moment in the story you maybe got a better feeling for the character and you think, well, he's, he's going to do this. So it is what it mm -hmm. is. And then you just kind of go from there. And so now I kind of, I mainly, in terms of just how I plan out a story, I like to think about the way they're going to meet and then the reason that they can't be together. And I think those are kind of like the, the launching blocks, I guess, for the story. And then past that, you mm -hmm. just sort of have to make choices along the way for, you know, 
as things present themselves that are problems or how are they going to overcome this but i think as long as you have those two fundamental things for for the way i write at least it's kind of like i can figure it out in the middle so i usually just start a chapter and then i don't really know what's going to happen i just kind of start clacking away and then figure it out as i go okay yeah i hear that so much so many writers i mean uh, like successful authors that i've talked to have probably even like less training like they've taken like no classes on it they just don't know anything about plotting and they just like go for it yeah. and kind of like how you said with your first one i'm just like being authentic and not trying to like fit in the mold that really seems to work for people which yeah is, well and that's which is good i try to help because i'll meet other people who are sort of just starting out or hoping to start out and so i've talked to a lot of other authors that you know i try to help them and it feels like it's it's a really common kind of mistake that people make is that they get mm -hmm. and I, it might just be a lack of confidence i think when people aren't super confident in their own ideas or their own ability to kind of i don't know express what they're feeling in their cover or their the words or whatever is that they they pick somebody or some group of authors and then they just sort of and it, it sounds a little mean but it's like they go and like the they'll pull it up in multiple windows when they're making the cover and then they're just they're trying to grab parts of it and make it just different enough that it's their own and they're not trying to do it maliciously but it's it's like they don't have mm -hmm. the confidence or they don't realize that what will help them is if they can just find a way to take a bigger step away from what everybody else is doing and i i think i go too far <laughs> with that like in my own covers because my covers are crazy um but it's i think your covers are good they're very clean thanks. they're very like on brand i like it yeah they're just kind of weird <laughs> Do you have, um, I, I thought I was reading some of your blog. Do you have, um, do you have a background in graphic design or you just do it? Right? I, you just know I how to tried, do it. Learn how I to spent do it. a lot of time trying to figure it out, um, but I didn't have a background mm -hmm. in it. It was like the very first book. So my first book ever wasn't on Penelope Bloom. I wrote four books in sci-fi romance before that first Penelope Bloom book. And that mm -hmm. was where I kind of really got the kinks out <laughs> so like i i tried to work with a cover designer for my very first book in sci-fi romance and that mm -hmm. was i really didn't enjoy it it just sort of felt like i had a picture for what i wanted the cover to look like and a lot of the process was just it almost felt like somebody else had the hand here and i was grabbing their hand and trying to make them draw it and then it was kind of it made me think well why don't i just figure out how to do it myself which that's a little okay. bit of a problem <laughs> I have is that I have trouble delegating. So um, mm -hmm. I probably would get a lot more done if I was better at letting other people do things for me. But I've gradually mm -hmm. sort of, I started off having more help even with my wife and then I've kind of slowly absorbed all the control. And now it feels like I'm the only person doing any of it, but it's my own fault. Mm -hmm. I just, I have trouble delegating, I guess. Delegating, yeah. Yeah, but it well, was a lot it of work. Worked, it worked. Yeah. Yeah. The worst I part I think so in learning much... to do the covers was the typography. And it's kind of something that you take a little for granted when you're not, if you've never tried to make one. But, you know, if mm -hmm. you just look at a romance cover, a typical one, it's a guy and then there's some text. And you don't realize until you go to make your own, if you pick one of the fonts that comes with Photoshop or something, it looks terrible right away. And you can't really tell mm -hmm. why. You just, you kind of look at it and you're like, that doesn't look right. And, then the other problem is you have to teach your your eye almost to recognize what looks right with a romance font so not just a mm -hmm. font that looks good in general like helvetica or something is a font that people use in design and billboards for mcdonald's and it looks fine there but if you put helvetica on a romance cover it's just like a little too dry and stale so there's like all these kind of mm -hmm. minute little things and then there's also the blending of different fonts so you find a really good font for your title but then you've got to find a font that kind of looks like it fits, even though it's not the same font, but it looks like it fits for the subtitle. So it, that to me was definitely the, the biggest learning curve and I still struggle with that. But the other stuff isn't maybe as bad as you would think. So how long do you end up spending on writing every day? And then how long do you spend on all the other responsibilities that you have? Um, my goal is to spend two hours a day mm -hmm. writing like actively writing i kind of i try to break it up in sprints of 20 minutes so it's like i'll set a timer for 20 minutes and then i usually do like three in the morning like i'll go to panera and eat a bagel or something and then i write for 
20 minutes and then I take a five minute break and then I do 20 minutes, five minute break and I do that three times. And then I come home and kind of just do other stuff mm -hmm. and procrastinate. And then I try to stop my work day at 3 p.m. And so it's kind of like usually after lunch, maybe around like one o'clock, I realize I need to get my other two sprints in. And so I wish it was more structured. And I've had periods where I've been pretty structured, but usually I spend somewhere between one and two hours writing to if I'm meeting my goal. And then for the other stuff, it's kind of, um, it depends on the time, more like the period of a book I'm in. So like if I'm at the, the tail end of finishing a book, then my administrative stuff kind of starts to escalate because I've got to set up um, like Facebook ads and Amazon ads and book promos and work on the cover, maybe more if I haven't finished it yet and then kind of set up my posts for like my newsletter and just there's all these kind of like little things that come from specifically from publishing the book and then also after I publish there's kind of a burst of communication from readers that comes in so usually I don't really get a bunch of emails from people asking me questions between books it's like right after I publish a book I, I tend to get a bunch of emails kind of someone found a typo in my book or you know somebody <laughs> wants to know why they can't find a paperback or they can't get it to download you know it's like a tech support mm. uh, hour of people kind of just bombarding and um, then on Facebook there will be people with comments and stuff so it's it shifts a little bit I kind of prefer that like downtime about a week or two after a launch when it is all kind of calms down and then I can really focus on the next book mm -hmm. but Lately, it's been taking me more like two or three months to finish a book, so I get a, a lot longer of a down period. But the um, the disadvantage is kind of like I was saying earlier, if the book doesn't do well or if I get feedback, it takes me longer to kind of work that into the next book. And then the, the cycle just kind of breaks down a little bit if it's not as fast. So mm -hmm. I'm always trying to work on that, but I struggle with it. It's just kind of, it's a lot of writing to do every day. Yeah. I mean, what's the what's the word count? Is it like two hours and it has to be a specific word count or is it just two hours and whatever happens? I've tried. Yeah, I've tried both. Like I, I actually maybe only about a year ago, I started thinking about it in terms of time and not word count. Mm -hmm. And I used to always say 5000 words. Wow. But the the problem I found with thinking about word count is that um, whatever word count you pick, there's kind of a it's like a daunting task to me it's more daunting to think of it say at 1 p.m if i know i have two hours left in my day and i check my word document and i realize i've written 1800 words so mm -hmm. far and then i think wow i have to write 3200 words in the next two hours yeah. and then i might just go can't do it <laughs> try again tomorrow you know and then it doesn't happen mm -hmm. but if i know if i have my little five boxes that i check every time i do a sprint and it's two or even yeah even if it's 2 p.m and I realize I still have two 20 minute sprints left I there's there's not a part of me that says I can't do mm -hmm. it I have to admit I just don't want to do it because <laughs> I have the time you know it's like I have 20 minutes and then I have enough time for a 10 minute break if I want it and then another 20 minutes and that's all I have left so mm -hmm. I've found that my um my likelihood to talk myself out of doing it or psych myself out or just kind of get intimidated or the, all the different things that seem to happen with word count have gone down and then um, it also helps because I don't know that it, it really makes the most sense to, to rate yourself on your total output as much as it does in your total effort mm -hmm. you know if you're if you want to keep it up long term and if you don't want to feel miserable every day like I I'm like the worst boss and the worst employee at the same time. Sometimes, you know, like the boss part of me is like, why didn't you write more? And the employee part of me is like, why do you want me to write so much? <laughs> and so it's it's easier if you think of it in terms of time because then it's like, that's doable. Even mm -hmm. as the employee, I can admit, you know, two hours is, it's hard. You know, if somebody asks you to go outside and run really fast for two hours, you might be like, oh, I'm going to need a little time for yeah. that. And that's kind of how it works. You know, you, it's really hard to just sprint for two hours and that's why... Mm -hmm you think of them as sprints because you kind of got to recharge the, right. the tank a little bit. So I think that's kind of 5,000 words. Is some people, most people I know that write still think of it in terms of word count. I just, for me personally, that helps to kind of think of it in terms of time instead. Mm -hmm. And then I, sometimes I do write less because of it. Like two hours usually gets me about 5,000 words, lot. but it could be as little as 3,500. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you only have to do that if you're actually good about it, you get a book finished if it's 50,000 words in about three weeks if you write 
-hmm. even 4,000 words a day, you know, so you don't really need, unless you're really just trying to crank out books, you know. Yeah, that's crazy. I can write tops like 2,000 words in two hours, but 5,000, that's good. That's talent as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's like a, actually, a, a kind of an interesting point about writing faster, I think, is that one thing I've noticed hits me when I'm when I start slowing down I think it's actually a lack of confidence that slows a lot of people down mm-hmm. more so than it is lack of talent or lack of anything else yeah. and um, so I'll notice when I'm slowing down I just start if I actually look at why I'm slowing down it's because I'm starting to doubt what I've put mm-hmm. down or I'll, I'll look back on my last two paragraphs and I'll think those weren't very good or this conversation is kind of <laughs> stiff or this doesn't feel realistic or he wouldn't say all this and those are the thoughts for me that try to derail me in the middle of writing Mm -hmm. and so I think the trick is to find a way to be more confident in what you're Mm -hmm. writing if you can because when you're confident it's it's just kind of comes out at least in my case Mm -hmm. that if I'm not doubting what I'm writing I can write really fast and then the books where I'm really just not feeling it and I'm worried that people aren't going to like them those are the ones that take me forever because I just keep kind of you get in the mindset that if I'm adding more right now, I'm just screwing mm-hmm. it up. So why would I, you know, why I just sprint for another 10 minutes and continue to screw this scene up mm-hmm. when I could maybe come back tomorrow or in a few hours and then have a clear head and fix it. But what I find is that if you just shut down that voice and push through it, a lot of times when I go back and reread those moments that I thought in the moment were bad or didn't feel like me or they kind of like, they weren't as good as I normally try to be, I read them over again, and I'm like, oh, that wasn't actually that mm-hmm. bad. Sometimes I read it, and I'm like, oh, that was bad. I should have stopped. <laughs> but that's always easier to fix after the fact, and then you can kind of just handle it when you have more energy okay. later. So you do, overall, you think it's better to just keep going with it and not second-guess yourself? Yeah, and one little thing I do, too, is I put asterisks. If, I ever, if I'm ever just like, this is bad, <laughs> there's no maybe about it like this whole scene was bad or this whole conversation or even just this line or like sometimes it's something dumb you know I don't know how to describe him getting out of the chair and going to the door and I've spent 20 seconds kind of going "Uh," (laughs) he walked he shuffled and then I just put asterisks and I I put get him to Mm -hmm. the door and then when I finish the whole story or if I'm just kind of if I need a break I can search for asterisks and then it's kind of like writing is a series of problem solving so as these little things come up I can go back and find them and sometimes you know if you step away from a problem and come back it's it just it's, it seems super simple mm-hmm. and so I've found that a lot of times those are way easier to solve if you just move right past them instead of letting yourself get stuck and feeling like you have to fix it before you can move yeah. on that's good advice so so what other writing tips would you have for our our writers um, I guess one would be, so like whether you're writing romance or anything mm-hmm. else, and it's kind of been interesting for me because I know I'm writing romance, which wasn't my, as a reader, my genre of, as it's not the thing I grew up reading mm-hmm. and it. It's not necessarily if I go to the bookstore, now I kind of will, you know, like wander over to the romance books and pick one up because it's, it's become like an interest to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just kind of, I like seeing what other people are doing and you can get a good idea here and there, but before that, before I got kind of neck deep in all of it, it it just wasn't my thing. And so what it let me do though when I first started is it it let me be objective about what it felt like the market wanted versus what I wanted to give the market. Mm -hmm. And I can kind of compare that to with what it would feel like, for example, if I was trying to write a fantasy book, which I've tried. And even now, knowing everything I know, I have this issue where if I thought, okay, I'm gonna write a fantasy book next week, I wouldn't want to do the things that I know I should do, which are to study the market and figure out what exactly the readers in the market are looking for right now. Mm. Um, Maybe it's like teen girl goes to magic school from London or something. Mm. And I'm like, that's not my (laughs) book. And so then it doesn't, you know what I mean? So in romance though, I I had the ability because I kind of had, I came into it with a little less personal investment. Mm. I was able to kind of look at it and say, all right, if, if people want a book about a single dad, then sure, that's that's just as much of a challenge for me to write as a book about uh, some kind of like BDSM club or a, a banana, you know, whatever it happens to be. So it's just kind of like the being a step removed lets me see it more clearly. And so if I was giving advice to anybody, 
it would be that even if if you really do want to succeed you kind of can't ignore what the market mm-hmm. wants it's like being a chef and not taking the order you can't unless you're like a the best chef in the world you can't just go into the kitchen and cook what you want to cook mm-hmm. and then set it down in front of people and hope they're going to like mm-hmm. it they might be allergic to seafood and you made the best lobster <laughs> in the world but they're like i can't eat this yeah. so as as tempting as it is to think i can write exactly what i want and i'm going to be like george r, r. martin and everyone's going to devour mm-hmm. it if you kind of go in with that mindset it's basically like playing the lottery mm-hmm. and it's it's kind of not as satisfying to think about having to cater to an audience but once you do it i think you can kind of realize if you actually care about the writing and you care about making it good and learning and getting better it's it's still just as satisfying and it's more satisfying because people are enjoying it and reading it mm-hmm. and so many people kind of get into it and then nobody ever reads it because they didn't take the time to kind of take the order of the market mm-hmm. you know like if they were the chef and so i think that's probably the the most fundamental before you even think about what you're going to write kind of advice mm-hmm. i would give and then um maybe just a a broad thing kind of generalizing what i was saying before is that you've got to find a way to not need your book to be perfect mm-hmm. if you're ever going to publish it because if you do what i did in fantasy you'll never finish the book if it has to be perfect and you mm-hmm. kind of have to realize it's never going to be perfect even if you want it to be and that's what helps me let go is that i would love for my book to be perfect and i would love for my next book to kind of take readers by storm and then they can't stop talking about it and everybody loves it but no matter how much effort i put into making my book perfect it's not going to happen mm-hmm. so i'm better off finishing that book and learning from my mistakes and then applying what i learned to the next book and so it's kind of like you can spend 15 years making one book as perfect as you can and it'll be a 62 out of 100 cuz you've never written a book before and you'll screw up a lot of stuff yeah. or you can spend 15 years writing a book every month and your first book was a 62 and then you're a 68 and you kind of go back and forth but after 15 years you're probably going to be writing a lot of 95s mm-hmm. out of 100 because you've learned so much and so you don't have to try to make it what you would have had you just would have been out of reach before mm-hmm. so i think that's kind of my my broad advice and then my maybe about writing and then about what to mm-hmm. write so for, would you consider yourself a perfectionist like i know people are some people are there are perfectionists and some people just get things done. So for the person who's a perfectionist, how do you think they would know when it's time like when enough is enough? That's it's interesting because I've been I've learned that I'm a perfectionist if I feel personally invested mm-hmm. in the content of the story like in fantasy. Um and then I can let go more when I'm coming at it objectively. So for me I guess the advice would be that if you find you're you're being too much of a perfectionist, the first thing I would do is ask are you actually writing to the market? Like are you writing for somebody else or are you writing for yourself? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of almost like a I'm sure there's people who have frowned to hear somebody say, "What do you mean are you writing for somebody else? Everything you write should be for yourself." But I think that's a little dishonest for a lot of people because it's there's very few people I've met that actually would write a book knowing no one's ever going to read it. It's kind of a the whole point is telling a story is to to get interaction and to have people experience it. Mm. It's like if you were going to tell a story out loud, would you sit in an empty room and just talk to yourself? And then it sounds kind of crazy, but then people will say, "Well, I'm only writing this for myself." Mm-hmm. And I just I don't think that's true. I'm sure there's people out there that that's true, but mm-hmm. good for them. But if you if you are writing for other people, then you kind of have to ask yourself first of all, "Am I writing this for somebody else?" and if you are that other person doesn't expect it to be perfect mm-hmm. especially in self publishing mm-hmm. and the other problem is that there is no perfect you know your perfect is not somebody else's perfect and then it's still not somebody else's mm-hmm. perfect that's something i kind of had to learn with trying to do humor mm-hmm. is that you know if you go into a room of 100 people and tell a joke you're probably not going to get all 100 of them to mm-hmm. laugh especially if they can't hear each other. You know, sometimes in a like a comedy club everybody laughs cuz it's kind of like a a group experience. Mm-hmm. But if they're all isolated, mm-hmm. you're probably going to get like 40 people to laugh and then the other mm-hmm. are just going to be staring at you and then there's going to be 10 that are pissed off that you made the joke. And it's it's kind of like a good mm-hmm. joke is going to piss off some mm-hmm. people. It's going to irritate mm-hmm. others. It's going to make other people think you're just aggressively not funny. Yeah. And then some people are going to love it. But if you try to make a joke that everybody loves, then the best you're going to get is like a 
a little breath out their nose, you know, you'll get like a bunch of... Yeah. <laughs> so when I was trying to kind of get into writing rom-com, I had to accept that it's not going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be people that are not just won't think I'm funny, but people who are going to be mad that I tried to be funny mm -hmm. in the way I tried to be funny. And it's kind of hard to read some of the reviews on my rom-coms that are... I've I've heard some things about my humor that uh, they're not super flattering, but then I gotta just remember there's people who do like yeah. it, and I try to stick to if I think it's kind of funny, then that's what I go with. So it, it's like my my guiding pole mm -hmm. for if I'm making a joke, you know, if it kind of makes me grin, then I'm gonna go with it. Yeah. And there's definitely people who aren't, and that kind of applies to everything though, not just humor. So mm -hmm. somebody new starting out that wants to be perfect has to realize that you're not going to make your sentence perfect. Just kind of go with your best and then tell yourself to learn from it. If you get feedback after the fact that tells you it wasn't great or it was horrible or whatever you hear. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned something about, um, about the publishing, about self-publishing. You've done both, I believe, right? Self-publishing and with a publisher. So mm -hmm. yeah, a question we always get yeah. from our writers is, what should I do? What's better, self-publishing or to go with a publisher? I think for a lot of people, the truth is that it's it's a lot harder to get traditionally published, obviously, mm -hmm. because there's no barrier to self-publishing. So that's not like a pretentious statement. It's just somebody has to look at your book and say, we want this for traditionally published work. For self-publishing, nobody has to approve it at all. So the first kind of question is, do you want that difficulty barrier? The second question is what kind of time frame are you looking at? Because if you do really want to pursue traditional published material, you're going to have, I think at least, even if they accepted your book right away, it would be about six months before it hits the stores. And then it'd be several more months until you get money probably. You might get some of it for signing the contract. But so there's time and then there's difficulty, but in general, I think if you're writing romance specifically, and I, I don't really want to try to give advice outside romance mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm only writing in romance, so I'm not going to pretend to understand what's going on outside of there. But within romance, I think that there's enough ability to kind of make a career for yourself in self-publishing. Mm -hmm. And then there's also enough of kind of a decline in what traditional publishing is doing and able to do that it in general without any qualifications I would just say you should probably self-publish and not worry about traditional publishing mm -hmm. and I think that one of the, the appeals and one of the draws of traditional publishing is if you're somebody who knows I'm never going to get marketing down, I'm never going to understand cover design, I'm never going to be able to write my own blurb, I just want to write a book and I don't want to have to think about anything else then in that case you kind of have to tra tra traditionally I can't say it, traditionally publish. Mm -hmm. And if you want to self-publish, you have to accept that you're going to be wearing multiple hats. And you mm -hmm. kind of, you don't just have to become a better writer. You have to keep thinking of it as you're, you're trying to master like six different professions. You know, you're your own publicist, you're your own marketer, you're designer. Even if you're working with a cover designer, you kind of have to have an eye for design in self-publishing. Mm -hmm because you can't just take what they give you and say, cool, this is great, and expect to get good results. You kind of have to have an idea for what you want your brand to be and what you want to look like. Mm -hmm. So in general, if you're somebody who's just never going to want to do all that stuff, then traditional publishing is going to be a harder road, but it might be the only viable one. Mm -hmm. But if you think that that stuff isn't overwhelming and you think you're capable of kind of learning it all, then self-publishing may, may be the way to go. Mm -hmm. And um, Money-wise, like if you're just thinking about financial incentives, there's kind of, it's like there's a realistic ceiling in self-publishing that's a lot higher than traditional publishing. And then, you know, there's the giants in both. So I don't really know if, if the top, top self-publishers make more money than the top, top authors with traditional publishers. Mm -hmm. But I know that there's people who support themselves super comfortably in both. Mm -hmm. But there's, I think there's less money to go around in traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. um, and then my own personal experience with it was just that after having all the control and getting used to being in charge of my own cover and my blurb and my advertising and everything mm -hmm. else, it felt really weird to kind of hand that over to somebody. And um, 
like the series I did with Montlake was anyone but, and then it was like Rich, Kate, and Nick. Mm -hmm. And um, the first set of covers they sent me, none of them looked like rom-com covers. And I remember kind of going back and forth and saying, you know, I, these are cool, but I, I'd given them a really specific idea for what mm -hmm. I thought the cover should look like, and I imagined they would do it. They didn't listen to yeah. me. They just kind of did what their designer mm -hmm. did. And then um, they told me that not to worry about it because the advertising would be so obviously rom-com that it would convince people mm -hmm. or something. I don't know. I, I kind of just took their word mm -hmm. for it because I figured they knew more mm -hmm. than me. And um, those books didn't do very well. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was kind of, uh, it was frustrating because it took a lot longer and a lot more work to write the books for traditional publishing than it does to write them for self-publishing. Mm -hmm. Like in self-publishing, I have one editor and probably should have two with how many typos I, I have in my books. But um, in traditional publishing, they have three rounds of editing, at least Montlake did. It was, the first round was developmental editing, which is like plot mm -hmm. stuff. And I went back and forth with the developmental editor about maybe three times. And so this kind of, it was new to me too, because I started working on the next book and then I had stuff from my previous book coming back to haunt me. And I was like, hey, this isn't what I'm used to. I'm, I'm used to kind of finishing it and dusting my hands and moving mm -hmm. on. And then the developmental edits finished and then there were copy edits, which were kind of line edits and proofreading. And then that was coming to me while I was working on the third book. And then those copy edits finished and then there was a final round of, I forgot what they call it, but they, I guess they sat around a table and read it out loud and that was the final round and then there were some things they caught there but that was coming to me while the developmental edits for book two were coming so it kind of it created this sort of stacking effect mm -hmm. that for me i like to be focused on one main project at mm -hmm. a time and that really didn't suit my uh i guess my style mm -hmm. of doing things so it's there's a lot to consider and it's hard to give a definitive mm -hmm. answer but those are just kind of some of my experiences mm -hmm. with it and it's different. It feels a lot different, mm -hmm. for sure. But overall, just it's kind of about what you want to mm -hmm. take on. So if you think that there's no way you're going to be good at the marketing and the design, then hand it <laughs> over. But if you think you might have it, yeah, then stick to this. And the only, I guess, yeah, the only caveat is, like, you can pay somebody to set up your ads and run mm -hmm. them for you. And you can obviously pay a cover designer, and you should. Most people, I probably should, too. But I like doing it, so I kind of stubbornly keep doing my own. But you can kind of outsource that stuff. But the problem is if you don't know what you're looking for, it's hard to find a good person unless you know somebody you trust is already mm -hmm. doing it and they can tell you who to, who to go for. But there's no real true just set it in somebody else's lap and forget it in self-publishing because you're the, the CEO. So you've got to manage your, your employees and make sure they're doing a good job. And you can't do that if you don't know what their job is. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't know what your advertiser is doing, for all you know, he's wasting your money every day. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. not ideal. Yeah. <laughs> so. So, so what is your next project that we should be keeping our eyes out for? Um, I'm like four or five chapters into it mm -hmm. right now. It's a, uh, I've been on this weird, which I think I, I don't know why I do this to myself, but I, I had a good thing going in normal rom-com and then I decided to do like paranormal mm -hmm. rom-com I guess just because it felt like it the was the vampire fun. one and it was fun I noticed kiss, yeah kiss, I, did, I did kiss kiss <laughs> fang fang yeah <laughs> and um so I'm doing the next it's it's not a sequel to it it's just like another paranormal mm -hmm. one and I'm planning on doing three of those total and I, I have two titles but I'm not 100% sure which one I'm going to go with yet it's either going to be um what was it it's so he's a werewolf and she's a vampire like in this it. one. And it, the title's either going to be I Bite, She Sucks, or it's going to be um, I, I, bit, what, I Bit a Wolf and He Liked It. I, I think so I like I'm, the first one better, but that's just me. Yeah, it kind of fits with the... Yeah, I know. I, I also want to do the cover differently, which I'm, I'm kind of struggling with mm -hmm. right now. I had Sometimes I get like a clear image of what I want mm -hmm. in my head, but then I don't have the ability to pull it off which is frustrating <laughs> so I'm kind of like in the process of trying to figure out how to do what mm -hmm. I want to do and um, it would be easier to do with a longer title is kind of what's leaning me maybe towards a little bit on the second title because I'm picturing less of the, uh, the cartoon characters on the cover kind of mm -hmm. thing I, I wasn't sure I was a big fan of that and um, 
and I had to pay like a illustrator to do that which I was fine with and he did a really good job but it it felt like somebody else did the cover like all I did was put the words on right. it and he made the picture mm -hmm. and um, it just didn't feel mm -hmm. the same so I kind of want to go back to having Full control again my <laughs> control yeah <laughs> so um, I'm in the process of trying to figure out what to do with that okay. cover and I may or may not fall back on the illustration again if I just can't figure mm -hmm. it out all right well we'll keep an eye out for it and our, um, so our writers can kind of keep up with uh, what you've been doing and what you, um, you know, you kind of have a little bit of advice on there as well as updates on your blog, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm usually, I post a blog update about when I, every time I make a mm -hmm. new book. So like sometimes every month and then lately like every two or three okay. months. All right. So yeah, we'll put a link there for everybody to check that out. Okay, cool. All right. Well, any last words of wisdom or anything? Or have we drained you completely? <laughs> um, no, I, I can't think of anything. Just I feel like I've kind of given yeah. my all the wisdom I have. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we loved having you on, and we loved having you, um, you know, expose the real self behind Penelope. 